Hello and welcome. I'm Sarah Brown and I'm here today with the chairs of three of the main therapy organisations in the UK. Julian Lozada, chair of the British Psychoanalytic Council, Janet Wise, chair of the United Kingdom Council for Psychotherapy, and Andrew Reeves, chair of the British Association for Counselling and Psychotherapy. I'd like to start by asking you, Andrew, could you explain um, what it is you're announcing today? I will. Hello, Sarah. Nice Hello. to see you. Um, I'm delighted to be sitting here alongside Julian and Janet. Um, and today, together, we're announcing a collaboration between our three organisations. Um, I think, you know, it's been a, a process over many years where we've worked together and we've worked together informally on, on different things in different areas. And I think we're moving to a point where we're needing to kind of formalise that a little bit. So not, not bring the organisations together, keep our, our distinct identities, but to identify kind of the common themes in the field that we really do need to address. So it feels a, a really exciting step forward um, for a profession that I think is really starting to gain a maturity. Thank you. Julian, would you like to add anything there? Well, yes. I, mean, I, I, you know, I would reiterate that I, you know, it is quite a, uh, a step that the three of us are here representing our three organisations. From my point of view, the, the, we don't really have a profession of counselling and psychotherapy. We have a lot of people who do it. And I think what links the three organisations is how do you help a profession emerge and how does it play, play its part in um, the provision of mental of services to the mentally distressed? Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that we're all very aware of is how much distress there is and how important it is to have a range of responses to that distress. So we will be looking for ways in which we can enter, if you like, the the contemporary discourse around mental um, health. It's interesting it's called health and we deal with mental ill health. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a very, very um, pronounced um, difficulty in our society today. Janet, do you want to say something? Like Julian and Andrew, I'm also delighted to be sitting here today and talking about a more formalised collaboration. As Andrew said, we have been collaborating more and more. But I think given the increasing awareness of mental, mental distress, um, the reducing slightly of the stigma of people coming and talking about their struggles, I think that the three organisations coming together to collaborate is absolutely right at this point in time in order for the public to be able to have access to more therapies, counselling and psychotherapy. Thank you. Julian, would you like to say something about how the organisations will collaborate um, and how they will remain distinct? Well, um, there's no disguising that, you know, we there are different modalities of treatment. And so to some extent, although it's not really a very accurate description, description. We represent different modalities, different trainings and so on. And that's healthy in this profession. I think the idea that a, one training is all we need is absurd given the complexity. So I think one of the issues would be to sort of, with some confidence to say this is a profession where there are all these modalities, but they, they share a discipline that we're all concerned with the quality of what our members um, deliver. And so there are a lot of questions about the setting, the trainings, um, what kind of protection there are for patients and so forth. So all of those sorts of issues, rather than us each having our own methods, I think increasingly we're trying to find what do we have in common. Even though we might do the work slightly differently, but how can we convince the public and how can we convince people who make policy that we are credible, um, we're disciplined, and then actually we do deliver a service that's essential. That's one thing. The other thing I think is, you know, mental health policy, uh, let alone practice, is highly contested. There is really no agreement about the nature of mental distress. And we think we have a lot to say about what we've learnt about that. And I think 
our collective voices are likely to be more powerful than our individual ones. And what about the way that the organisations will remain distinct? Do either of you want to say something about that? Well, I think that the organisations do have distinct identities. They have evolved differently. And therefore, the identity of each individual organisation will remain. And I think needs to be, in a way, nurtured because the, the robustness of the three organisations and the diversity that they have uh, is going to be beneficial to the public, to the delivery of services. So I think that our identities will remain unless there comes a day when actually they don't need to anymore. But I don't see that happening. Anytime soon. Anytime soon. Andrew, would you like to say something about how the working together of the organisations will help members of the public? And yes, yes, I will do. And before I do, can I just kind of pick up on what, yeah. what Janet and Julian were saying? Because I really agree with what they're saying. And I think that there's something very important in in the distinctiveness of the organisations. Because what Julian was saying um, at the beginning of, of your answer, Julian, was around... Um, the, the, you know, there isn't a one size that fits all here. The, the people are individuals, they present with their individual distress and their individual experience. And there is room in the field, and I think an, an efficacy to demonstrate that, the, that we all actually have an important contribution to make. And if we can keep um, that distinction organisationally, but also privilege the, the difference between us, then I think what we can do is contribute to a culture whereby um, clients, patients have, have choice about what it is they access um, and how they access it. And I, I, for me, that's crucially important, which kind of picks up on yeah. the, the question that you've, you've asked me, Sarah, about you know, how will this make a difference. Mm. Um, you know, I, th I think it will make a difference potentially in a whole range of ways. So um, within the profession, whether it's a profession or something that's emerging around professional standards, about accountability, around ethics, about conduct, you know, what, what we do is start to, to further the work that we've done individually to really create a, a robust profession that, that clients can trust in, but also key stakeholders, the NHS or third sector or or wherever they are. Um, and then I think fundamentally for, for our clients or, or patients, um, it's about being able to access a therapist, absolutely trusting the robustness of what they do and why they do it, and that there's an evidence base and there is a commonality. We might come at it sometimes from different philosophical positions or different traditions, and I think that, that that's really healthy. But as a, as a client walking through the door... I can trust that there's a robustness about what this person is doing and that it's, it's trustworthy and benchmarked. Yeah. Janet, do you want to say something about how clients will benefit from the collaboration? I, I agree that I think clients will benefit by knowing that they will be able to access a therapist or a counsellor from a, a group of organisations where there is a robustness from the training that that counsellor or therapist has gone through and their ongoing professional development um, and I think that will be very important for the for the clients to know that they have someone that has gone through that robustness of training. Um, wh where do you all think the profession will be in 10 years time? Perhaps I could start with you Julian. Well that's a very difficult question. Um, it's not where, I mean I suppose where might be where it's located. Is it located in uh, the private sector or is it located in the public um, domain? And I think all of us would um, argue that it needs to be in both, but it is increasingly being pushed into the private sector. And there are problems with that because when we think about clients, it's a sort of generic term. We're thinking about adults, old people, children, adolescents, families, couples. And they all live in a system. They all live in a social context. So where they get treated might depend, you know, if you're an adolescent, it might be at school, it might be at a youth club. Very, very difficult to get adolescents in, um, to have access to psych psychological therapies, counselling, whatever. 
but it's critical for their future mental health that they do, and they are woefully badly served. So if you ask where will we be in the future, uh, my view is that um, this is not a hobby profession. It's an essential collegiate profession to the education professions, the medical professions, and so forth. Um, and if we together can sort of press home that debate um, and really influence policy, which frankly we've not done very well in my judgment. I don't know what, what my colleagues say. It's not that we've had no successes, but um, we need to be a bit more robust in, in being clear about what sorts of policies we think um, are appropriate and what we can contribute to. I would like the profession and the professionals and mental health to have absolute parity with physical health. I had a personal example recently where I was, I was unexpectedly unwell and was in casualty and every part of my body was checked except for my mind. And I just laughed, I thought, ironically. How do you know that this wasn't something psychological? And that is a small example of where I'd like the profession to be five years from now, not ten years mm, from now. And I fine. think the collaboration between our three organisations will give us a much stronger voice to go out there and say, this mental health is as important as physical health. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, would, I would agree with all of that. And I suppose you can reverse the question and say, you know, where might we be in 10 years' time if we weren't collaborating? And yeah. I think we would be at best in disarray. Yeah. And at worst, might not exist in the form that we exist now and that we would be pushed more and more to the margins. And, and I think there's something crucial in what's being said here, and which, which I, can, I think speaks of where I would like us to be, again, in 10 years, but, but hopefully much sooner than that, is, is around cultural change. So yes, to influence policy, yes, to to ensure a, a robust evidence base. Um, but, but picking upon the, the kind of parity of, of esteem that, that Janet raised, which I think is absolutely fundamental here, that, um, that, that we, we all recognise that our emotional well-being is as crucial and as central to our physical well-being. You know, I, I find in the, the work I, I do with clients, when I ask about their, how do, how do you take care of your emotional health, they kind of look at me blankly. And if I ask how do you take care of your physical health, they'll reel off a whole load of things that they either do or don't do. Um, and that's a cultural shift that needs to change because um, if we don't do that, then I think that there are massive ramifications, not for just us individually and how we exist in our world and, and relate to our living, but I think um, societally as well. You know, We become more separated, we become more um, distinct from each other. Um, and I think we, we become a much unhealthier society. So I know they're, they're kind of big claims, but I, I agree with Julian. I, I think that the psychological therapies, counselling and, and psychotherapy, have enormous contribution to make, which at the moment I don't think we do to best effect. Yeah, can I just... I, thank you for that. Um, you see, I think Janet puts her finger on a strong argument we've got, and it's about the health economy. If you think about the price to the NHS of medically unexplained symptoms. It is enormous. And everybody knows that these patients are presenting to um, a &E or the hospitals with very serious symptoms that have no physical explanation. And it's clearly a psychological, a substantial psychological dimension. Now, if we, if we were present, if people had worried about uh, you know, Janet's state of mind when she was in hospital. I worry about her state of mind all the time, but, I mean, if they'd worried about it, um, then they might have saved a lot of money. We know, you know, in terms of the numbers of people presenting at GP surgeries. I mean, the cost is enormous. Now, if, um, you know, psychologically-minded people could actually work with these patients... Um, all sorts of benefits would accrue. And just picking up on what you were saying there, and I was given the example of when I was in um, A&E, but in primary care, in your GP practice, it is absolutely vital mm. that you have highly experienced and trained therapists and counsellors who are able to assess 
those people that are coming through the door. Because if you've got the medically unexplained symptom, they will go to the GP with their neck ache or their back ache. That's how they present. Yeah. And that's what is needed as well. Yes. So if, if there was one major change um, that could have come from this collaboration... Uh, a change in terms of either access to choice of or awareness of counselling and psychotherapy or, or anything else, um, what would that be? I think for me it's got to be access to, of course, choice as well. Um, and we know that there are limited choices to whether it be modalities or client groups. Um, I also think, well... I. You've asked me one thing. I could go on many things, but I think a core, a core improvement change needs to happen in that primary care setting and in schools as well. You were talking before about, uh, if you like, educating people in their emotional health, and surely that should be in schools. I think if... I mean, it's invidious to have to choose one, but I agree with what Janet said, but... If, if our members really believed that we were slowly and thoughtfully creating a, an effective collaboration, more of them might get involved seriously in the public work of what we do. The problem with counselling and psychotherapy is that it is essentially private. But the three of us represent, if you like, a minority of people in our profession who also want to work publicly in the, in the context of development of the service. So one of the things that I hope will happen is, you know, in a period when people don't trust organisations, that they entrust the integrity of our endeavour. You know, I don't want to be immodest, you know, and we've talked about our differences and they will continue and they will be um, engaged with. And that's nothing wrong with that. But I would hope that all of our members would have a look and say, gosh, here's an organisation with various parts that we would want to get more active in. I'm lucky in going last because I can say I agree with Janet and Julian, so I get three because they've, they've articulated the first two. And my, my third would be kind of split across two areas. One, one would be about how treatment guidelines are developed and how evidence is used. And, and for me, I would like to see us develop even more sophistication about evidence and what evidence means um, and how evidence is conceptualised and then that relationship that the evidence base has with, with the development of treatment guidelines. So the, going back to our very, very early points, the, the treatment Treatments can be based around a, a whole range of different approaches that, that all have an important contribution to make, which I think is, is, is partly at the heart of, of our collaboration. And, and, and the, the, the kind of bit that I would add into that, which I don't think we're very good at doing, although I think we're committed to try and, and do better, um, is around client voice. You know, I think that um, we need to continue to be seen to be um, professionals that are developing practice-based evidence and evidence-based practice that is informed by client voice and experience. Because um, I think we, we have a lot to learn from that. And I think the more we can be open to that affirmation, but also that challenge, then I think we can, we can develop a, a greater professional maturity. Yes, because I, mean, I suppose it's very much about what this looks like to the client, isn't it? Mm -hmm. What does this mm -hmm. look like to the, to the public, this, yeah. this change? And, and that's why we're here. That's why we're sitting in this room, mm. you know. That, I mean, that, that while, while we have had differences over the years in perspective and idea, or why we've kind of wrestled with those, which I think has contributed to us coming to this point, the reason why we're all sitting in this room together um, is fundamentally that we can deliver the best that we can deliver to the people who, who need that service. Mm. And the that's seen as a viable and positive um, option that can sit alongside some of the options that have, have been around much longer. And I think it's a particular point in time that we are in with people increasingly speaking out about their struggles, um, whether it be MPs, sports people, and if, in a way, if we don't grab that opportunity now, I think we would be sitting somewhere in a year or two's time regretting not having taken this opportunity now and the stigma around mental health needs to be broken down and, and removed. 
It's, it's almost a, a moral choice, I think, isn't it, as, as, to collaborate and to do the best that you you can for for the public and you know for people suffering from mental health problems. I think I think it's a moral choice. I think it's a moral and ethical imperative. Mm. Actually, I, I mm. think um, in a se- in a sense we we can talk about whether we should or shouldn't or whether we have a choice to collaborate. I, for for me, there is no choice here. You know, this is this is what we have to do, not for our own gain, but this is about promoting and, and supporting something that actually, when we come down to it, saves people's lives. We all keep saying we agree and we do, but I, you see, I do think we're swimming against the tide. Um, you know, people talk very easily about a relational world, and that's what we all stand for, that actually what makes you know, somebody feel better about themselves is the quality of the relationships they have. Mm-hmm. But we live in a world where all sorts, you know, which is increasingly fragmented, that all the kind of glue of family and social life is, you know, much less um, gluey than it was. Um, so, um, yeah, I think we need to be, I, I think it is a, an imperative, but I think we also need to be modest and clear about what we think are the, the factors in the world that actually are moving in the other direction. And there are many, it seems For example, to me. I was thinking of, you know, the huge amount of antidepressants which are now prescribed. I mean, that's oh, just wow. yeah. an enormous... Um, that's right. But I suppose, you know, that one could argue um, that, you know, we have to be dedicated to, you know, relational work. Um, and not to um, to be cautious about the sort of creeping industrialization of mental health, where um, people claim a product, an outcome, you know, which is at best a little dubious. Often, you know, sometimes you can really demonstrate that. But you know, people's sense of well-being is such a subtle and variable. Um, experience, you know, we're not, we don't all feel happy in the same way, or sad in the same way, or angry in the same way. It's a product of all sorts of things. So, um, I think we just need to be careful that we don't sort of parrot, you know, the contemporary um, discourse. I don't think we have been, but I think we need to maybe be a, a bit oppositional. I hope, a bit of healthy opposition. I was just thinking, as you were uh, talking there about resilience, and in a way healthy opposition uh, can be voiced when somebody feels that they have resilience inside them, to be able to be robust and challenged. Absolutely. And I think that there's something about, when you were talking about antidepressants, that in a way I'm not sure that they usually help build up someone's resilience. They do something different. I think the interesting points around resilience and challenge that we can also take and apply to this collaborative process. The, um, you know, it has been a difficult journey at times, and I think there have been real challenges to us. And and I, I think you know it would be very easy to, to to kind of get stuck with those challenges. But I think there is something about um, out of that almost storming type process that that I think we we probably needed to go through. I think there is a, a development of, of resilience, and you know, collaboration isn't just about us, the three sitting in a room and agreeing with each other. You know, I think it's also about um, the discussions that we've also been having, where there are points of difference, and, and that we can be challenged, and, and we can use that for reflective space. And you know, I, so I don't think that a process of collaboration is is going to be always easy, or is going to to just go swimmingly. But I think. Um, I think there is a commitment across the three organisations to kind of wrestle with that and to to try and make that work. So so it becomes kind of a, a living, developing thing. So what do you think um, are some of the specific challenges um, that the profession are facing at the moment? Janet? I think some of the challenges the profession faces at the moment are around the reduction in the services for mental health services, both in primary and secondary care. Um, I think that alongside of that, with an increase in awareness of 
mental health and ill health. To have a reduction in services creates a deep imbalance. We know that people suffer and struggle with um, mental, mental issues and I think that there is a long way to go in improving access to, to waiting times and to the choice of therapies and for the different client groups. I think one of the big challenges is that we have a reputation for being you know, dominated by sort of, if it's not out of date now, sort of middle class issues with middle class um, professionals. Um, and I think we haven't done enough to demonstrate that we're interested in, you know, in working class people's lives. So, but not only working class, but people who suffer, you know, from racism or homophobia or ageism or sexism, that we haven't um, done enough to say that we understand that there's a, a mental health consequence to that lived experience. So I think we need, we've got quite a lot to do to say that we're, we're relevant, not in some generalised way to well-being or happiness, but actually we know that some um, parts of life are damn tough, the unemployed for example. Um, one of the challenges that I'm, I hope that we'll um, uh, find a way of um, making a statement about is, you know, when therapy is used as coercively, like uh, there's some suggestion that it might be used in um, back to work schemes, and I, you know, I think people have to choose therapy. You know, they have to counselling. They've got to know that there's something inside them. So, but I think you know, showing that we know about and are relevant to whatever the contemporary preoccupations are, and they change quite clearly. Uh, but I do agree that um, one of the big struggles is the reduction in in availability of services. Um, I can go through a whole list of services that have been cut, um, which also shows a sort of hostility to what we're trying to do. And, and I would agree with that, actually. And I think that I would I would pick up on, on Janet's point particularly, that um, we can focus on, on the reduction of mental health services in the, the statutory sector, so kind of in, in the health service. Um, what that does in turn is place greater pressure on the voluntary sector. So um, organisations that are delivering really high quality services um, but with even less funding and they're being squeezed and they're being closed down. So what we're actually seeing is um, a, a reinforcement that, that human experience is always and inevitably a, 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 a medical problem where actually it is also related to, to very important social issues as, as Julian just outlined there. Mm. Um, but actually, if I'm wanting to seek therapy, I might not choose to do that through my GP or, or through a health service. I might want to do that through an organisation that I see is much more embedded in my community and understands me as an individual much more. And, you know, I, I work quite closely with, with volunteer organisations and they're really squeezed. You know, they are being closed down and services are being scaled back. And I think what that does is reinforce the difficulties we have in um, placing emotional well-being alongside an equivalence with physical well-being. And I think it, it contributes to a culture where our mental health or emotional health is kind of dispensable or it's not important. Mm. So, you know, that, that's a real challenge and a real problem that, that we, we have to, to grapple with. Yeah. Can I just emphasise that point, the point you've made? Because we... We live in a, a moment where there's all sorts of rhetoric about well-being and mindfulness and happiness and so on. But at precisely the time when all the services that Andrew's just been describing are losing their funding. Now, that is, some, that is a real problem. And it's the sort of problem that breeds cynicism and further undermines people's confidence um, that you know, political people mean what they say when they're going to invest in parity of esteem. Well, it's manifestly clear they're not doing so. So, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And just as a slight tangent to that, but not dissimilar, is there may be people that will choose to 
want to access counselling or psychotherapy in the private sector. Yes. Mm-hmm. But if they're being offered antidepressants as the, if you like, treatment of choice, then they may take that instead of thinking about whether some form of counselling or therapy would actually benefit them as much, maybe more so. So I think it's the medicalization and the, the, the antidepressant culture that has grown. Well, I'm sure these debates will, will carry on. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for um, coming and talking today. Um, if you'd like to find out more about our collaborative project, uh, you can visit any of the organisation's websites. Um, and thank you for listening. <laughs>